Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Interfaith Interconnect Religion Chat. And hello to all of you who are out there on Facebook, too. Welcome. Is anyone here at Religion Chat for the first time? One of our speakers, maybe, right? <laughs> all right. So thank you very much to Muslim Community Center East Bay for hosting and also for live streaming the program. Interfaith Interconnect holds our religion chat on the second Wednesday most months, and we welcome your suggestions for topics. So you can tell us uh, if you have ideas for topics, or you can email us at interfaith.interconnect at gmail.com. As is our custom, we'll begin with our Interfaith Interconnect's mission statement which is to enrich, inform, and educate ourselves and others about the great diversity of faiths and cultures in our valley. Today's topic, which is the last of a session of three, is when bad things happen to good people, how does your faith or congregation help someone to recover following a significant loss, emergency, or tragedy? And our presenters are Wanda Osler from Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and Omar Nason, who is from here at Muslim Community Center. Each speaker has 25 minutes total for their presentations, which includes some time for questions. And so now let's welcome our first speaker, Omar Nason. Thank you. Omar. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum, greetings of peace and uh, blessings to all of you. It's a pleasure to be amongst all of you today in your virtual and digital presence um, and to, extreme, to receive the privilege of sharing this panel today with my esteemed colleague from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mrs. Osler, it's a pleasure. Um, I'm excited to learn from you today. Um, and just to shed a little bit of light on how Islam deals with this incredible topic. I believe that this topic is one of incredible import in the light of cont the contemporary landscape of our world. Currently around the world at this very moment, innocent people are suffering not only individually but collectively. And many are in the midst of wars, famines, and even genocides, like that one currently occurring in Palestine. So I ask that as we proceed through the presentation today, that we keep these individuals and these communities in our hearts and in our minds, and that after this event, that we reflect upon the words that are shared here tonight, and that we each say a prayer for our suffering brothers and sisters across the world, for their relief and for the betterment of their health and their status, and that we remember the thousands of innocent lives that have been brutally eviscerated in Palestine to this day. So on to the topic of the night, um, the question of why bad things happen to good people. It's a profound question, a universal question. It touches the core of human existence, and every faith tradition has its own approach to the question. It offers its adherents a way to understand and to cope with the trials of life. And in Islam, suffering and loss are viewed through a very unique lens, a lens that blends spiritual insight with practical guidance. And I hope to take just a few minutes here to begin to explore how Islamic teachings and community support can assist individuals to recover from significant loss, emergencies, and tragedies. So in Islam, life is understood as a test from Allah, from God, and the Quran repeatedly emphasizes that all human beings, regardless of wealth, class, or social status, will be tested in a variety of ways, including through loss and through hardship. So for instance, Allah in the Qur'an foretells us in uh, Surah number 2, verse 155, that we will certainly test you with a touch of fear and famine, a loss of property, life, and crops, but give good news to those who patiently endure. This verse highlights the inevitability of the trials of this existence, while also underscoring the importance of patience. Patience is not just passive endurance, but an active state of perseverance and trust in Allah's wisdom and mercy. The trials that Muslims are to bear are seen in the light of steadfastness and patience as opportunities for growth, purification, and ways of drawing closer to their Lord. Faith also plays a crucial role in how Muslims can cope with adversity. Belief in Allah's omnipotence and benevolence provides a framework within which suffering can be understood for the Muslim. 
key aspects of the faith can begin to be approached in three ways. The trust in Allah. Muslims are encouraged to place full, unquestioning trust in Allah and His divine plan, believing firmly that He is the best planner and that everything that occurs happens for a divine reason. Even if this reason is beyond human comprehension, we are to be firm in that faith and understanding. This trust is a source of solace for the believer, and it reassures them that their suffering is not random, but part of a greater divine plan. Next is divine decree. This concept refers to the belief in divine predestination. Muslims believe that everything, good or bad, happens by the will of Allah in accordance with His infinite and divine wisdom. This belief can help mitigate feelings of helplessness and despair, and emphasizes that Allah and His infinite wisdom has a purpose for every event, that although we may not be aware of it at the time of tragedy, can play a small play role within the grander scheme of life. Then there is, of course, the afterlife. A belief in the afterlife is crucial to Islamic theology. Muslims here, we believe that the world is transient, this existing world, and that true recompense awaits one in the hereafter. This belief provides hope and also perspective, reminding the believer that ultimate justice and reward lie beyond the earthly life, and that this life is instead just solely a test and a trial with which to find ultimate fruition upon departure from this temporal plane of existence. So we must remember that hardships, calamities, and distress are constantly rippling throughout the world and that their outcomes are unknown amongst us in humanity. For none knows except what Allah knows, and Allah knows what will be, how it will be, and when it will be. A person may take precautions against what they fear, but they may unknowingly flee from a place of safety to a place of danger. This is something that we're reminded of in the Qur'an. Allah says in uh, Surah 59 verse 2, And they thought their strongholds would put them out of Allah's reach, but the decree of Allah came upon them from where they never expected. All events and their outcomes, with their bitterness and their sweetness, their good and their evil, are all within the administration, command, and decree of Allah. Therefore, the greatest protection and the strongest fortification for the Muslim when faced with calamity is yaqeen, a certainty in God. There are different forms of this that the believer in anguish is advised of and reminded to internalize that we'll go ahead and review here. Firstly, there is yaqeen in all that Allah has informed in his knowledge of the unseen and his encompassment of everything. When faced with distress, the believer is reminded that every matter that they fear, everything they anticipate, all of these things are not outside the knowledge and the power of Allah. Thus, true internalization of yaqeen in this sense strengthens the heart of the believer and lightens the pain of calamities and afflictions. Despite their enormity and destructive power, they diminish and vanish in the hearts of those certain of Allah's knowledge and Allah's power as if there were something insignificant. Yaqeen removes the impact of affliction from the hearts, and with it, pain is reduced. The coolness of Yaqeen extinguishes the, the heat of the calamity, bringing serenity to the heart and filling it with tranquility. Furthermore, there is Yaqeen in the wisdom of Allah, which fills the hearts with trust in His divine plan, that whatever He causes to happen, and whatever He decrees for individuals and for communities, contains divine wisdom in line with his divine ultimate plan. And this is whether or not people are aware of some of its wisdom or none of its wisdom. The internalization of this type of yaqeen in Allah's wisdom by the believer aids one in dispelling the satanic insinuations that events that occur are purposeless or simply mere coincidences. For whoever is certain of a wise Lord knows that all of God's actions have wisdom to them and they are thus relieved from overthinking and from anxieties, and they do not submit to the whispers of Satan. They secure themselves in the foreseeable future, and they do not fear the unseen and the unknown. Then there is yaqeen and Allah's mercy that provides comfort and solace not found by those lacking certainty and those who think negatively of their Lord. For how can the one who is certain that Allah is more merciful to them than even their parents or all created peoples even more than themselves, fear a hidden fate. And how can they fear the unknown? How could they think otherwise, when they know that he who decrees is more merciful to them than anyone in existence? Lastly, the believer in pain is reminded to internalize yaqeen in Allah's promise that those with strong God consciousness will have a good outcome in this world and the next. And this is with the, in accordance with the words of Allah that he says in the Quran, Surah number 28, verse 83, that eternal home in the hereafter we reserve only for those who seek neither tyranny nor corruption on the earth. The ultimate outcome belongs only to the righteous. 
Islamic teachings emphasize the importance of community in providing support to those in need during these times of hardship and despair. The Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, said, The believers in their mutual love, mercy, and compassion are like one body. If one part of the body feels pain, the whole body responds to it with wakefulness and with fever. This metaphor illustrates the collective responsibility expected of the Muslim community to support those in distress. Key ways in which this support is manifested include through emotional support. The community provides a network of emotional support through family, friends, and neighbors. Expressions of sympathy and solidarity, such as visiting the bereaved, offering condolences, and participating in collective prayers, helps to alleviate the burden of grief and allow the ones suffering to find solace in their fellow believers, and also for them to grieve in community, avoiding isolation during a devastating period in their lives. Next is financial assistance. Islam incorporates charitable giving as a critical and essential component of faith. This includes zakat, which is obligatory almsgiving, and sadaqa, which is voluntary charity. Some of these funds can be used to support those who have suffered financial loss due to emergency and tragedy, ensuring that their basic needs are met if they are in requisite need of fiscal assistance when faced with calamities. Then there is, of course, spiritual guidance. Religious leaders and scholars play a pivotal role in providing spiritual guidance and counseling to those in need. One of the responsibilities of a spiritual leader in Islam is to offer pastoral care in the form of prayers, recitations of the Quran, and religious advice that can help individuals find comfort and meaning in their suffering to cope with their loss. They can also be advanced in their spiritual journey through their loss and move forward with their lives and overcome the tragedy through the help of this pastoral care. So I want to take a little bit of time to dive a bit further into the pastoral element and blending the communal with the individual in forms of assisting those dealing with tragedy. For Allah says in the Quran, in Surah number 3, verse 102, O you who believe, be mindful of Allah in the way He deserves, and do not die except in a state of full submission to Him. With this sentiment, the believer is reminded, either by their own personal reflection or with the help of that of a religious leader, that... Faith and God consciousness are the reasons for their tests and trials in the world that are causing their distress. The believer is reminded that their reward for their steadfastness during this time of extreme hardship is a paradise as vast as the heavens and the earth. Paradise is surrounded by the disliked in this world, just as hell is surrounded by the desires of this world. The best of creation, the messengers and the prophets, peace be upon all of them, they were the most severely tested in our history. So by comparison, the trials that they faced would be unbearable for the normal person. And this is in accordance with what Allah says in the Quran in verse uh, 214 of Surah number 2. Do you think that you will be admitted into paradise without being tested like those before you? They were afflicted with suffering and adversity and were so violently shaken that even the messenger and the believers with him cried out, When will Allah's help come? Indeed, Allah's help is always near. Furthermore, in a hadith or a saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, after which he was asked which of the people is tried most severely, he said, the prophets, then those nearest to them, and then those nearest to them. A man is tried according to his religion. If he is firm in his faith, then his trials are more severe. And if he is frail in his faith, then he is tried according to the strength of his faith. The servant shall continue to be tried until he is left walking upon the earth without any sins. Frequently in providing pastoral care to those in distress, the stories of the prophets will be retold to them. Specifically, the stories in which the prophets underwent extreme hardship, loss, or failure um, in their path towards serving Allah. And these inspire the believer and advise them to remain steadfast in their faith, to have hope in the divine decree of Allah, and to find guidance in those whom Allah has sent to show us the way. So let us consider the example of a family that has lost a loved one unexpectedly. The immediate response from the community would typically include offering condolences, providing meals to assist them in their time of need, and to help them with arranging the funeral and all that encompasses it. The family is encouraged to seek solace in prayer and in the remembrance of Allah. Islamic tradition even includes specific prayers for the deceased, such as the funeral prayer which the community performs collectively upon the burying of the deceased. This act not only honors the one who passed, but also reinforces communal bonds and provides comfort to the grieving family. Moreover, the family is reminded of the Islamic teachings on death and the afterlife, reinforcing the belief that the deceased is in a better place so that if they live the righteous life. The Quranic verse, 
Surah number 2, verse 156, Indeed we belong to Allah, and indeed to Him we will return, is often recited to remind the grieving one of the transient nature of life and the internal nature of the hereafter. So then let us look at another case study, something like a natural disaster. In the event of a natural disaster, the Muslim community's response is characterized by immediate and organized relief efforts. Islamic organizations often mobilize their standby resources to provide food, shelter, medical aid, and psychological support to the affected individuals and community in this situation. During such crises, communal prayers are held to seek Allah's mercy and His protection. The community also engages in collective acts of worship such as reciting the Qur'an and making supplications, asking Allah to alleviate the suffering of those affected. Regarding the supplication from both examples, Islam teaches that from the mercy of Allah upon all of creation is that He responds to the supplication of the distressed and the troubled, be they sinners or disbelievers. Allah made this among the signs of His Lordship, and He is the Lord of all, believers and disbelievers alike, the righteous and the wicked. So he responds to the supplications of the distressed just as he provides sustenance. Uh, he makes this explicit in the Quran in Surah number 27, verse 62. Is he not best who responds to the desperate ones when he calls upon him and removes evil and makes you inheritors of the earth? And as such, there are even specific supplications for times of distress that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, guided us to. And if they are invoked by the distress, it is befitting that Allah relieves the distress of the supplicant. For example, there's a saying of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, peace be upon him, that teaches one of these supplications in which the supplicant is to say, There is none rightfully worshipped other than Allah the Almighty, the Forbearing. There is none rightfully worshipped other than Allah, Lord of the Magnificent Throne. There is none rightfully worshipped other than Allah, Lord of the Heavens and the Earth, and Lord of the Noble Throne. This is one of the greatest supplications used for times of distress. And the context of this hadith indicates the Prophet used to consistently rem recite this remembrance in all of his distresses. And it is a great remembrance that reminds of the greatness of Allah, his forbearance upon his servants, and an explanation of the manifestations of his greatness in the creation of the throne, the heavens, and the earth. It also affirms the lordship of Allah, his divinity, his names, and his attributes. And this is the perfection of tawheed, the oneness of Allah. This is the absolute core of the religion of Islam. Tawheed is the central message of Islam, and it is at the forefront even here when supplicating during times of tribulation. However, the supplicant is also reminded that it is crucial, while invoking supplications with the aim of relieving distress, to attach their heart to Allah, and not to turn towards any other. One should feel the greatness of Allah, and His knowledge of every distressed being, and His ability to relieve that distress. The supplicant should also contemplate upon his, the profound meanings of the supplications of relieving distress, what they include regarding the oneness of Allah, His most beautiful names, and its highest attributes. And they should be certain of the response, which is that Allah is the sole reliever of distress, the remover of sorrow, and the eliminator of grief. Now along with supplication, Islamic teachings also emphasize action and resilience and rebuilding. The Qur'an teaches in Surah number 5, verse 32, And whoever saves one, it is as if he has saved mankind entirely. This verse motivates the community to work together in reconstructing homes, restoring livelihoods, and ensuring that the affected individuals facing tragedy can resume their lives with dignity and with hope. Beyond this support, individual practices are vital in helping Muslims recover from loss and tragedy. These include prayer. Regular prayer maintains a connection with one, of one with Allah, provides spiritual strength and, com and comfort, and is a time for personal reflection and supplication, where individuals can seek His guidance and support in their time of need. Then there is the recitation of the Qur'an. The Qur'an is the source of healing and guidance for the believer, and reciting and refle reflect reflecting upon its verses can provide comfort and clarity during times of distress. There is supplication, as we mentioned. It involves directly asking Allah for His help and guidance and relief, and is a powerful way to express one's needs and trust in his, for His mercy. And then there is the remembrance of Allah. Engaging in this act involving repeating phrases that glorify Him, they help keep the mind focused on the Divine and foster a sense of peace and of contentment. And then there is seeking knowledge. Understanding the deeper meaning of life's trials through religious study, it can help, uh, it can help uh, perspective, provide perspective and alleviate confusion. Learning from the lives of the prophets and the righteous companions who face immense trials can offer inspiration and guidance for the one in distress. And the believer is in most need of the Creator in all aspects of their life, but especially when they're faced with calamity and distress. 
The believer is comforted by leaning upon their Lord as their support system and their true source of help and aid. The devoted servant is a dutiful worshiper in submission and humility to Allah. The stronger the connection between the believer and their Lord, uh, and if the believer is constantly obedient to their Lord, then they are to be certain that Allah guides their way, enlightens their judgment, strengthens their resolve, increases their strength, and fortifies their connection to the religion. The dutiful servants of Allah realize that remembrance of their Lord is their source of strength, especially when they are hurt and weak and that the need to nourish their souls is stronger than the pains of their bodies. Rather, the substance from which their bodies draw their strength is the elevation of their souls, for their hearts are attached to Allah. Their tongues are constantly in the remembrance of their Lord, and the remembrance of their Lord and the supplications that they make, when made by an unoccupied heart and a present mind, make it far more likely that those remembrances are to be heard, and that their supplications are to be answered. This act of worship nourishes the soul and strengthens the inner self and tames the will. For this, we look to the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was forbearing in what he encountered of difficulty and hardships while struggling for the path of his Lord. What he encountered of trials and harm and how he was able to repel the plotting of his adversaries. For Allah says in the Quran, in Surah, in Surah Hijr, verses 97-98, and we already know that your chest is constrained by what they say. So glorify the praises of your Lord and be of those who prostrate themselves to him. Meaning here, rely upon Allah your creator, for he will suffice you and give you victory over them. So busy yourself with the remembrance of Allah. Praise him, glorify him, and worship him. And that is prayer. The heart of the believer is nourished and content in a manner that cannot be imagined whenever it turns and connects to their Lord. On the other hand, when one turns away from obeying their Lord and is heedless, and that heart dies. A believer cannot find peace in their heart, nor calm their mind and relax their chest, except with the worship of their Lord. So these acts of worship and obedience that a believer does are a means, by the permission of Allah, for attaining tranquility, patience, and steadfastness when faced with harm and distress. Their worries and anxieties disappear, and their dep depression is prevented. And, it, and these worshiping acts do away with the strains and stresses that a believer feels when they face the hardships of life. So to sort of wrap things up here, um, it would be best to remember that in Islam, suffering and loss are viewed as integral aspects of human life. These are by which a ways in which God has designed to test and strengthen the faith of those who believe. It's a combination of spiritual beliefs, communal support, and individual practices with which Muslims are equipped to navigate the challenges posed by a significant loss, emergency, or tragedy. Faith in the divine wisdom of Allah, His divine decree, and the hope of the hereafter provide a strong foundation for resilience. The support of the Muslim community, coupled with personal spiritual practices, help individuals to find solace and recover from life's inevitable hardships. In this sense, Islam offers a comprehensive and compassionate approach to coping with adversity and enables the believers to emerge from their trials with renewed strength and faith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omar. Uh, would are you willing to take a few questions? No? Okay. This time, yeah. Okay. I don't want to take away from it. Okay. Yeah. No, we're fine. We got, we started a little bit late. We're fine. Um, is there someone who has a question for Omar right now? Chris. Okay, I'm going to hand you the microphone, okay. He talked about the, uh, the hope of, the, in the case of the ultimate loss, loss of a loved one uh, through death, uh, the hope that they are in a much better place. Uh, I was hoping you might speak a little more about it in a practical sense, uh, how that, that works for people. What, uh, you know, how, do you, how do you have confidence in that for people who have passed? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. Well, ultimately, we know that the judgment is with Allah. God is the one true judge, and with Him lies the fates of all souls. And we have faith in Allah through His words that He's provided with us in the Quran, that if we work towards His path, if we strive towards Him, if we have faith in Him, and if we live a dedicated life to His teachings and practices by following His commandments and worshiping Him and following His, his Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon Him, loving Him and loving the Prophet, that we have confidence that the one who has passed, 
that they are they are with Allah. We we often say in our prayers and supplications for those who have deceased who are deceased that uh, oh Allah with um, this past this one who has passed he is they are in your care and take care of them for you are the one who takes care of the souls. So we know that they're under Allah's care and if um, if they were true in their faith and they're true in their acts then we have confidence that that these people are um, are with their Lord and they're in that better place and we also strive um, in their name afterwards you know supplicate for them and do the communal prayer for them upon their passing um, so these things uh, their, their acts of charities live on and so we have faith in these actions and these in this their faith that Allah will take care of them and provide them with um, with, with tranquility in the hereafter Thanks again, Omar. Um, and if you are able to stay a little bit at the end, if people think of further questions, we have some time at the end, if you can stay, that you can just chat in small groups so you could ask questions at that point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now we have Wanda Osler from Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Wanda? Is it best to hold this? Or? It's a little loud, so I would keep it up okay. distance. Yeah. All right. All right, <clears throat> I'm happy to be here. Um, the topic, as I understood it, was how our church helps its members and friends to recover from significant loss, emergency, or tragedy. So my comments will be a little more basic as far as and the, the process. Um, but to begin with, I want to define some terms so that you can better understand what I'm talking about. In our church, we are divided into units called stakes, and typically be, it's between 1,000 and 5,000 members. Within each stake, there are smaller units or wards typically about seven to ten in the stake and with about 200 to 600 members. These are similar to the Catholic dioceses and parishes. Um, the head of the ward is called a bishop and he has two counselors. He serves in this calling typically about five years. The women's organization within the ward is called Relief Society. They are uh, charged with providing relief. Um, and the Relief Society president serves about three years and has two counselors. The Relief Society of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the largest women's organization in the world. I have served three times as a Relief Society president in my ward. I served in those positions while working to raise our six children and volunteering at local schools. I am currently the president of our stake Relief Society, working with the nine other units with their Relief Society presidents over each unit. All of our local leaders, male and female, serve voluntarily without compensation. <clears throat> Members of our church refer to each other as brother and sister, promoting the idea that we are family and the idea that we should be looking out for each other. Indeed, as children of a loving Heavenly Father, we regard every person on the planet as our brother and sister and feel a sense of familial responsibility toward everyone. Within each ward, the Relief Society members are assigned about three sisters to minister to. This is done by contacting each woman on your list on a regular basis, checking in on how things are going, and basically just being their friend. The men's group, called the Elders Quorum, assigns each member or brother to minister to about three families, not just the brothers, but to families. And similarly, make contact on a regular basis and checking in on them. At least quarterly, the Relief Society presidency 
and the Elders Quorum Presidency meet with or call the various ministering brothers and sisters and ask them how their ministering route is going or if they are going and fulfilling their calling. The idea is that if we know our members and they know and trust us, they will be more apt to call on us when things go wrong. Very often people don't like to admit that they're having problems. But if their ministering brother and or sister has established a connection with them and are their friends, they may be able to help when the need arises. If a ministering brother or sister sees a problem or situation where a member could use assistance, the bishop and Relief Society president are notified and help is given. Our church provides a wide range of assistance to those in need. For those seeking employment, the church's employment services department identifies job opportunities and helps the member work on interviewing and resume skills to enhance job prospects. And I'll call it the church, but it's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, <laughs> operates what may be the largest non-governmental -gover welfare program in the world. It was begun during the Great Depression and includes dozens of farms, ranches, and storehouses, primarily in the United States, but internationally as well. These include banana farms in Hawaii, potato farms in Idaho, turkey farms in Utah, and a 300,000 acre cattle ranch in Florida. There is a very large welfare storehouse in Salt Lake City, five regional storehouses, <clears throat> and over 200 local storehouses stocked with large amounts of food, clothing, furniture, and other items. The church also operates a large number of production facilities, such as canneries and very large-scale bakeries, dairy production facilities, mills, and soap manufacturers. <clears throat> These facilities are managed by paid staff. However, volunteers provide the labor necessary to operate these projects. Although storehouses are used primarily to serve members, a substantial portion of our welfare goods and services are provided to anyone in need. This is especially true in cases of natural disaster. For example, as Hurricane Katrina approached New Orleans in 2005, even before most of the damage had been inflicted, the church loaded 450 large trucks with food and clothing from regional warehouses and sent them to New Orleans. They arrived within hours after the hurricane had passed, much sooner than any federal assistance. Similarly, in the aftermath of large storms or fires, the church organizes volunteers to go in and help with salvage and cleanup operations. My husband and I were surprised, thankful, and proud when newsreel footage showed our grown daughter among a large group of volunteers from Manhattan performing cleanup work on Long Island following Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Among the goods and services we provided to members of other faiths are copies of the Quran to Muslims who have suffered substantial loss in natural disasters. Now, all members are encouraged to provide service, not only to those they've been assigned to serve as ministering brother or sister, but to the membership at large and the general community. The church can provide financial assistance, whether for housing expenses, medical bills, or other expenses, 
but self-sufficiency is very strongly emphasized in our church. People who are able to do so are expected to work for the assistance they receive, for example, by helping the building maintenance or with the church's welfare program at one of the local storehouses. <clears throat> Funds to support the welfare program are derived from fast offerings donated by members. On the first Sunday of each month, members are expected to fast, skipping the first two meals of the day and donating the cost of those meals to the church to help with its welfare program. In addition, members are expected to tithe donating a tenth of their income to the church. Fast offering and tithing funds are used by the local church leaders or by the church internationally as needed. It may be said that we follow the Hopi Indian statement of caring, that if one has corn, we all have corn. We try to share what we have with all of our brothers and sisters. Although financial contributions are certainly encouraged, our church recognizes the importance of providing physical service. Writing a check, while nice, does not provide the kind of spiritual and emotional benefits that physical acts of service can produce. My husband still talks about how, when he was a very young boy, he went with his father to work at the church's cannery that was then in Oakland. His dad pointed out to my husband that their family physician, Milton Ream, who was wealthy and owned a large home and property in Hayward, that is now the Meek Estate, was there at the cannery working on canning apricots. His dad noted that Dr. Ream could have simply written a large check for more than the value of his physical services, and he probably did. But the Dr. Reem felt, as most of us do, that physical acts of service are the best way to show our love for each other and to strengthen our sense of empathy and caring. Whenever a member suffers serious health issues, the Bishop and Relief Society President provide for meals to be prepared and brought in by other members for rides to and from medical appointments, and other help with family needs that the ailing, ailing member is unable to provide. <clears throat> when members move in or out of the ward, it is common for the elders quorum and relief society to assist with packing and loading the family's belongings, leading to jokes about the elders quorum moving company and how we're much more enthusiastic about moving people into our ward, not away from it. But we help with both. I became aware after the fact of how kind and efficient these services are after I had a serious cycling accident in March last year. I'm told I was unconscious for 30 minutes and was rushed to Eden Trauma Center where I spent the next five days in the ICU and neural trauma unit. I remember virtually nothing about those days, but within in an hour of my arriving at Eden, our ward's bishop was on the phone with my husband. Priesthood holders were sent to provide me with a blessing of health and recovery. My ministering sister came to the hospital to visit me. The Relief Society offered to bring my husband meals, and dozens of members called my husband to see what they could do to help and to offer their prayers and support on my behalf. But of course, not all needs are physical or easily perceived by others. One of our hymns includes the line, in the quiet heart is hidden, sorrow that the eye can't see. That's why strong relationships among our members are so highly valued and encouraged. 
People suffering from grief, anxiety, or depression are more likely to receive the assistance they need from caring brothers or sisters or their bishop. Bishops, <clears throat> bishops spend hours each week counseling with members, referring them as needed to our church's family services organization for psychological support, grief counseling, marital counseling, addiction support groups, codependency support groups, or other assistance, including adoption services. Members are encouraged to attend seminar programs focusing on financial planning, continuing education, job preparation, and other living skills. <clears throat> Again, I can't overstate how seriously we take the admonition that we are each other's brothers and sisters, and that we have divine instructions to look out for each other. We do so, however imperfectly, with a thankful heart for the many good things we have been blessed with and, there, and are able to share with others. Thank you very much, Wanda. Sorry about my voice. Oh, okay. Does anyone have a question for Wanda? Ruth? Well, this, is, this, this isn't a question, but a couple of years ago, when there were wild fires in Northern California, a young friend went to help, and he was so impressed with the Mormon outreach. Um, they built tents, they offered food, they brought blankets, anything the people needed. And I thought... You know, what a good message um, that your church gives to the larger community when it does those kinds of efforts for the larger community. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Thank you, Ruth. Abdul? <laughs> Not a comment, but I mean, mainly comment. Uh, yeah, I remember I... <clears throat> Uh, as a part of Islamic Center of Livermore, uh, we were supposed to like do volunteer work in Livermore once a year, like it's called like, volunteer day. And <clears throat> so I had a very hard time to get like people from our community to mobilize. And then <clears throat> when I went to work, then we saw like 400 people came from the LDS church. <laughs> so I was totally totally impressed. And I, I don't know what is your secret, but we need to <laughs> learn it and apply it to the Muslim community so that we can get, yeah, like for example, today I tried to get so many people to this chat, but nobody showed up. <laughs> Thanks, Abdul. Okay, sure. Yeah, I got a question for you, lady. So, uh, the explanation you did, most of them is about the church, what are you guys doing? But you didn't go to the book, what is the, you know, books is about these things happen, like our Muslim brother explained about the Quran, but you didn't even go to the Bible or something to say religion-wise, because I, I heard it looks like you're talking about the Red Cross. Red Cross, people, people helping people, you know, if they need something, but I want to see what is your idea about the book, what the book says on this situation. You know what I'm saying? So are you, are you a Catholic or are you Mormon? Mormon. Okay, well, so, so the, the idea is in Mormonism, is this God, you, you guys believe God says go help people if they need, or no? Yes. Um, well, we believe that God is our eternal Father and that we are all His children. And therefore, we have been, uh, uh, I can't think of the word. Uh, anyway, we've been told that we need to take care of our brothers and sisters. And I agree that bad things will happen, and, um, but 
we have to step in and help where that need is. That shows the love that basically we're showing God's love to our brothers and sisters here on earth. So you believe in the, what do you believe, your belief is that the bad things happen to people? God has created those things or Satan? If it's a Satan does, but I believe as much as I know about their Mormonism, it says that Satan and Jesus are the same son of God. Am I right? They both are equal? Well, not equal. Um, they started out both as uh, sons of God, but Satan t or took a different path. Um, I don't think that the, tr the trouble in our lives is because God said, okay, I'm going to zap you. Or that, but mostly it's our own uh, weaknesses that he doesn't necessarily take away those trials that he sees us going through, but he will help us through those trials. And because of those trials, we will then become stronger. Um, I don't think that, I don't think that, like I say, I don't think God uh, determines that we're going to have trials, but he doesn't, when he sees us doing things that will cause us to have trials, he doesn't withdraw the trials. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. How about one more question? Okay. Okay. Thank you for your presentations. Um, I had a question, um, um, Mrs. Osler. Um, so maybe just for the sake of our Muslim audience, uh, who is probably very ignorant of um, Christianity, and uh, maybe you can explain just very briefly what what does LDS Church? What is that? Is it a Christian church? What's the differences? Maybe some basic similarities or differences with. I don't know, more sort of mainstream Protestant or Catholic beliefs, uh, just for the sake of sort of giving us a uh, um, kind of an introduction so we can get to know the LDS church a little bit better, I think. Is, is the Mormon the same thing as, as an LDS member? Things like that. Yeah. Yeah, there's been a lot of um, uh, names given to us since the church was founded in 1830. At the time, Mormons were, was a derogatory term. Um, since that time, it's changed a bit. It comes from the fact that we have a second set of scriptures besides the Bible called the Book of Mormon. And um, it has scripture in it as well. We are similar to Christian communities in that we believe that Jesus Christ came to earth. We believe in the atonement. We believe that, you know, in being baptized into our church. Um, I don't know how else I can describe it as far as with Muslim uh, Abdul, hold on, I'll bring you the microphone. Okay, okay. And then we'll make this the last question, and then if people want to stay and chat yeah. in small groups or individually, that would be great. Yeah, so I mean, uh, in line with uh, Dr. Aliata's question, so you said like you have a second second book, right? Uh, a second Besides book of scriptures, yes. So, so I know that like the Catholic and the Protestant, they have slightly different books so which one you are you well follow? we use the King James version of the Bible is that does that make version? sense uh, that is a protestant oh, so what is that Catholic version called Catholics, I think it's some additional chapters that at the end do oh I see yeah. oh, okay oh so you're close to the protestant then. 
Okay, let's give our speakers one more round of applause to thank them. And I'll just make a real brief announcement. Um, we are taking a little break for July. We won't have a religion chat in July. We are looking at planning a couple of special programs. Um, one of the things that, that we had offered was a tour of the Hindu temple. Our last speaker, Gaurav Rastogi, had volunteered um, to take our interfaith group on a tour of the um, Hindu temple. So we're going to work with him on organizing that. And we have a couple of other things we're looking at also. So keep an eye on your email for information about upcoming things. But July, we probably won't have any activities. Um, let's see if there's anything else. I think that's it. So if people would like to stay and just chat in small groups, you're welcome to do that. And I think we can stay till, is it 8.30? As long as we like. OK. Thanks again, everybody, for coming. And thank you for the people to the people who attended online.